hunting is the practice of killing or trapping any living organism, or pursuing it with the intent of doing so. Hunting wildlife or feral animals is most commonly done by humans for food, recreation, or trade. In present-day use, lawful hunting is distinguished from poaching, which is the killing, trapping or capture of the hunted species contrary to applicable law. The species that are hunted are referred to as game and are usually mammals and birds. Hunting can also be a means of pest control. Hunting advocates state that hunting can be a necessary component of modern wildlife management, for example, to help maintain a population of healthy animals within an environment's ecological carrying capacity when natural checks such as predators are absent. In the United States, wildlife managers are frequently part of hunting regulatory and licensing bodies, where they help to set rules on the number, manner and conditions in which game may be hunted. The pursuit, capture and release, or capture for food of fish is called fishing, which is not commonly categorized as a form of hunting. Trapping is also usually considered a separate activity. It is also not considered hunting to pursue animals without intent to kill them, as in wildlife photography or birdwatching. The practice of foraging or gathering materials from plants and mushrooms is also considered separate. Skillful tracking and acquisition of an elusive target has caused the word hunt to be used in the vernacular as a metaphor, as in treasure hunting, bargain hunting, and even hunting down corruption and waste. History, Paleolithic Hunting has a long history and may well predate the rise of the species Homo sapiens. While our earliest hominid ancestors were probably fugivores or omnivores, there is evidence that earlier Homo species and possibly also Australopithecine species, utilized larger animals for subsistence. Evidence from Western Kenya suggests that hunting may have occurred as long ago as two million years. Furthermore, evidence exists that hunting may have been one of the multiple environmental factors leading to extinctions of the Holocene megafauna and their replacement by smaller herbivores. It has been found that the North American megafauna extinction was coincidental with the Younger Dryas impact event, possibly making hunting a less critical factor in prehistoric species loss than had been previously thought. However, in other locations such as Australia, humans are thought to have played a very significant role in the extinction of the Australian megafauna that was widespread prior to human occupation. The closest surviving relatives of the human species are the two species of Pan, the common chimpanzee and bonobos. Common chimpanzees have an omnivorous diet that includes troop hunting behavior based on beta males being led by an alpha male. Bonobos have also been observed to occasionally engage in group hunting, but eat a mostly frugivorous diet. While it is undisputed that early humans were hunters, the importance of this for the emergence of the Homo genus from the earlier Australopithecines including the production of stone tools and eventually the control of fire, are emphasized in the hunting hypothesis and are emphasized in scenarios that stress omnivory and social interaction, including mating behavior, as essential in the emergence of human behavior or modernity. With the establishment of language, culture, and religion, hunting became a theme of stories and myths, as well as rituals such as dance and animal sacrifice. Hunting was a crucial component of hunter-gatherer societies before the domestication of livestock and the dawn of agriculture, beginning about 11,000 years ago. By the Mesolithic, hunting strategies had diversified with the development of the bow 18,000 years ago and the domestication of the dog about 15,000 years ago. There is fossil evidence for spear use in Asian hunting dating from approximately 16,200 years ago. Many species of animals have been hunted throughout history. It has been suggested that in North America and Eurasia, caribou and wild reindeer may well be the species of single greatest importance in the entire anthropological literature on hunting, although the varying importance of different species would depend on the geographic location. Hunter-gathering lifestyles remained prevalent in some parts of the New World, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Siberia, as well as all of Australia, until the European Age of Discovery. They still persist in some tribal societies, albeit in rapid decline. Peoples that preserved Paleolithic hunting gathering until the recent past include some indigenous peoples of the Amazonas, some Central and Southern African, some peoples of New Guinea, the Mlabri of Thailand and Laos, 
the Veda people of Sri Lanka, and a handful of uncontacted peoples. In Africa, the only remaining full-time hunter-gatherers are the Hadza of Tanzania. Criticism Archaeologist Louis Binford criticized the idea that early hominids and early humans were hunters. On the basis of the analysis of the skeletal remains of the consumed animals, he concluded that hominids and early humans were mostly scavengers, not hunters, and this idea is popular among some archaeologists and paleoanthropologists. Robert Blumenstein proposed the idea of confrontational scavenging, which involves challenging and scaring off other predators after they have made a kill, which he suggests could have been the leading method of obtaining protein-rich meat by early humans. Antiquity, even as animal domestication became relatively widespread and after the development of agriculture, hunting was usually a significant contributor to the human food supply. The supplementary meat and materials from hunting included protein, bone for implements, sinew for cordage, fur, feathers, rawhide and leather used in clothing. Man's earliest hunting weapons would have included rocks, spears, the atlatl, and bows and arrows. Hunting is still vital in marginal climates, especially those unsuited for pastoral uses or agriculture. For example, Inuit people in the Arctic trap and hunt animals for clothing and use the skins of sea mammals to make kayaks, clothing, and footwear. On ancient reliefs, especially from Mesopotamia, kings are often depicted as hunters of big game such as lions and are often portrayed hunting from a war chariot. The cultural and psychological importance of hunting in ancient societies is represented by deities such as the horn god Cernanos and lunar goddesses of classical antiquity, the Greek Artemis or Roman Diana. Taboos are often related to hunting, and mythological association of prey species with a divinity could be reflected in hunting restrictions such as a reserve surrounding a temple. Euripides' tale of Artemis and Actaeon, for example, may be seen as a caution against disrespect of prey or impudent boasting. With the domestication of the dog, birds of prey, and the ferret, various forms of animal-aided hunting developed, including venery, coursing, falconry, and ferreting. While these are all associated with medieval hunting, over time, various dog breeds were selected for very precise tasks during the hunt, reflected in such names as pointer and setter. Pastoral and agricultural societies. Even as agriculture and animal husbandry became more prevalent, hunting often remained as a part of human culture where the environment and social conditions allowed. Hunter gatherer societies persisted, even when increasingly confined to marginal areas. And within agricultural systems, hunting served to kill animals that prey upon domestic and wild animals or to attempt to extirpate animals seen by humans as competition for resources such as water or forage. When hunting moved from a subsistence activity to a social one, two trends emerged, the development of the role of the specialist hunter, with special training and equipment, the co-option of hunting as a sport for those of an upper social class, the meaning of the word game in Middle English evolved to include an animal which is hunted. As game became more of a luxury than a necessity, the stylized pursuit of it also became a luxury. Dangerous hunting, such as for lions or wild boars, often done on horseback or from a chariot, had a function similar to tournaments and manly sports. Hunting ranked as an honorable, somewhat competitive pastime to help the aristocracy practice skills of war in times of peace. In most parts of medieval Europe, the upper class obtained the sole rights to hunt in certain areas of a feudal territory. Game in these areas was used as a source of food and furs, often provided via professional huntsmen, but it was also expected to provide a form of recreation for the aristocracy. The importance of this proprietary view of game can be seen in the Robin Hood legends, in which one of the primary charges against the outlaws is that they hunt the king's deer. In contrast, Settlers in Anglophone colonies gloried democratically in hunting for all. In medieval Europe, hunting was considered part of the set of seven mechanical arts. Use of dogs, although various animals have been used to aid the hunter, such as ferrets, none has been as important as the dog. The domestication of the dog has led to a symbiotic relationship in which the dog has lost its evolutionary independence from humans in exchange for support. Dogs today are used to find, chase, and retrieve game and, sometimes, to kill it. 
hunting dogs allow humans to pursue and kill prey that would otherwise be very difficult or dangerous to hunt. Different breeds of dogs are used for different types of hunting. Waterfowl are commonly hunted using retrieving dogs such as the Labrador Retriever, the Golden Retriever, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, the Brittany Spaniel, and other similar breeds. The hunting of wild mammals in England and Wales with dogs was banned under the Hunting Act 2004. The wild mammals include fox, hare, deer and mink. Hunting with dogs is permissible, however, where it has been carried out in accordance with one of the exceptions in the Act. Religion Many prehistoric deities are depicted as predators or prey of humans, often in a zoomorphic form, perhaps alluding to the importance of hunting for most Paleolithic cultures. In many pagan religions, specific rituals are conducted before or after a hunt. The rituals done may vary according to the species hunted or the season the hunt is taking place. Often a hunting ground, or the hunt for one or more species, was reserved or prohibited in the context of a temple cult. Indian and Eastern Religions Hindu scriptures describe hunting as an acceptable occupation, as well as a sport of the kingly. Even figures considered godly are described to have engaged in hunting. One of the names of the god Jiva is Mrigavyada, which translates as the deer hunter. The word Mriga, in many Indian languages including Malayalam, not only stands for deer, but for all animals and animal instincts. Shiva, as Mrigavyada, is the one who destroys the animal instincts in human beings. In the epic Ramayana, Dasharatha, the father of Rama, is said to have the ability to hunt in the dark. During one of his hunting expeditions, he accidentally killed Shravana, mistaking him for game. During Rama's exile in the forest, Ravana kidnapped his wife, Sita, from their hut, while Rama was asked by Sita to capture a golden deer, and his brother Lakshman went after him. According to the Mahabharat, Pandu, the father of the Pandavas, accidentally killed the sage Kindama and his wife with an arrow, mistaking them for a deer. Krishna is said to have died after being accidentally wounded by an arrow of a hunter. Jainism teaches followers to have tremendous respect for all of life. Prohibitions for hunting and meat-eating are the fundamental conditions for being a Jain. Buddhism's first precept is the respect for all sentient life. The general approach by all Buddhists is to avoid killing any living animals. Buddha explained the issue by saying all fear death. Comparing others with oneself, one should neither kill nor cause to kill. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam From early Christian times, hunting has been forbidden to Roman Catholic Church clerics. Thus the Corpus Juris Canonici says, We forbid to all servants of God hunting and expeditions through the woods with hounds. And we also forbid them to keep hawks or falcons. The Fourth Council of the Lateran, held under Pope Innocent III, decreed, we interdict hunting or hawking to all clerics. The decree of the Council of Trent is worded more mildly, let clerics abstain from illicit hunting and hawking, which seems to imply that not all hunting is illicit, and canonists generally make a distinction declaring noisy hunting unlawful, but not quiet hunting. Ferraris gives it as the general sense of canonists that hunting is allowed to clerics if it be indulged in rarely and for sufficient cause, as necessity, utility or honest recreation, and with that moderation which is becoming to the ecclesiastical state. Ziegler, however, thinks that the interpretation of the canonists is not in accordance with the letter or spirit of the laws of the Church. Nevertheless, although a distinction between lawful and unlawful hunting is undoubtedly permissible, it is certain that a bishop can absolutely prohibit all hunting to the clerics of his diocese, as was done by synods at Milan, Avignon, Lear G. E., Cologne, and elsewhere. Benedict XIV declared that such synodal decrees are not too severe, as an absolute prohibition of hunting is more conformable to the ecclesiastical law. In practice, therefore, the synodal statutes of various localities must be consulted to discover whether they allow quiet hunting or prohibit it altogether. It is important to note that the Bible places no such restrictions on any Christian, as most do not observe kosher dietary laws. Hence Protestant clerics, Catholic lay parishioners, and Protestants have no religious restrictions on hunting. 
This is in accord with what is found in the Acts of the Apostles 1528-29, and 1 Timothy 4-4. Jewish hunting law, based on the Torah, is similar, permitting hunting of non-praying animals that are considered kosher for food, although hunting praying animals for food is strictly prohibited under rabbinic law. Hence, birds of prey are specifically prohibited and non-kosher. Hunting for sport, and not for food, is also forbidden in rabbinical law. Islamic Sharia law regarding hunting is the same as Jewish law, in that only non-praying animals that can be considered halal for food can be hunted, but only for food and not a sport. National Traditions, New Zealand New Zealand has a strong hunting culture. The islands making up New Zealand originally had no land mammals apart from bats. However, once Europeans arrived, game animals were introduced by acclimatization societies to provide New Zealanders with sport and a hunting resource. Deer, pigs, goats, rabbits, hare, tar and chamois all adapted well to the New Zealand terrain, and with no natural predators, their population exploded. Government agencies view the animals as pests due to their effects on the natural environment and on agricultural production, but hunters view them as a resource. Shikhar During the feudal and colonial times in British India, hunting was regarded as a regal sport in the numerous princely states, as many Maharajas and Nawabs, as well as British officers, maintained a whole corps of shikaris, who were native professional hunters. They would be headed by a master of the hunt who might be styled mere shikar. Often, they recruited the normally low-ranking local tribes because of their traditional knowledge of the environment and hunting techniques. Big game, such as Bengal tigers, might be hunted from the back of an elephant. Regional social norms are generally antagonistic to hunting, while a few sects, such as the Bishnoi, lay special emphasis on the conservation of particular species, such as the antelope. India's Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 bans the killing of all wild animals. However, the chief wildlife warden may, if satisfied that any wild animal from a specified list has become dangerous to human life, or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery, permit any person to hunt such an animal. In this case, the body of any wild animal killed or wounded becomes government property. Safari A safari from a Swahili word meaning a long journey, especially in Africa, is defined as an overland journey. Safari as a distinctive way of hunting was popularized by the U.S. author Ernest Hemingway and President Theodore Roosevelt. A safari may consist of a several days or even weeks long journey, with camping in the bush or jungle, while pursuing big game. Nowadays, it is often used to describe tours through African national parks to watch or hunt wildlife. Hunters are usually tourists, accompanied by licensed and highly regulated professional hunters, local guides, skinners, and porters in more difficult terrains. A special safari type is the solo safari, where all the license acquiring, stalking, preparation, and outfitting is done by the hunter himself. United Kingdom Unarmed fox hunting on horseback with hounds is the type of hunting most closely associated with the United Kingdom. In fact, hunting without qualification implies fox hunting. What in other countries is called hunting is called shooting, or stalking in Britain. Originally a form of vermin control to protect livestock, fox hunting became a popular social activity for newly wealthy upper classes in Victorian times and a traditional rural activity for riders and foot followers alike. Similar to fox hunting in many ways is the chasing of hares with hounds. Sight hounds, such as grey hounds, may be used to run down hare in coursing, with scent hounds such as beagles. Other sorts of fox hounds may also be used for hunting stags or mink. Deer stalking with rifles is carried out on foot without hounds, using stealth. These forms of hunting have been controversial in the UK. Animal welfare supporters believe that hunting causes unnecessary suffering to foxes, horses, and hounds. Proponents argue that it is culturally and perhaps economically important. Using dogs to chase wild mammals was made illegal in February 2005 by the Hunting Act 2004. Shooting traditions, game birds, especially pheasants, are shot with shotguns for sport in the UK. 
the British Association for Shooting and Conservation says that over a million people per year participate in shooting, including game shooting, clay pigeon shooting, and target shooting. Shooting is practiced in Britain, as opposed to traditional hunting, requires little questing for gamea euro around 35 million birds are released onto shooting estates every year, some having been factory farmed. Shoots can be elaborate affairs with guns placed in assigned positions and assistance to help load shotguns. When in position, beaters move through the areas of cover, swinging sticks or flags to drive the game out. Such events are often called drives. The open season for grouse in the UK begins on August 12, the so-called Glorious 12. The definition of game in the United Kingdom is governed by the Game Act 1831. United States North American hunting predates the United States by thousands of years and was an important part of many pre-Columbian Native American cultures. Native Americans retain some hunting rights and are exempt from some laws as part of Indian treaties and otherwise under federal law where Euro examples include eagle feather laws and exemptions in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. This is considered particularly important in Alaskan Native communities. Hunting is primarily regulated by state law. Additional regulations are imposed through United States environmental law in the case of migratory birds and endangered species. Regulations vary widely from state to state and govern the areas, time periods, techniques and methods by which specific game animals may be hunted. Some states make a distinction between protected species and unprotected species. Hunters of protected species require a hunting license in all states, for which completion of a hunting safety course is sometimes a prerequisite. Typically, game animals are divided into several categories for regulatory purposes. Typical categories, along with example species, are as follows, big game, white-tailed deer, mule deer, moose, elk, caribou, bear, bighorn sheep, pronghorn, boar, jave liner, small game, rabbit, hare, squirrel, opossum, raccoon, porcupine, skunk, ring-tailed cat, armadillo, ruffed grouse, verbaras, beaver, red fox, mink, pine martin, muskrat, otter, bobcat, predators, cougar, wolf, coyote, upland game bird, grouse, woodcock, shuka, pheasant, quail, dove, waterfowl, duck, teal, merganser, geese, swan. Hunting big game typically requires a tag for each animal harvested. Tags must be purchased in addition to the hunting license, and the number of tags issued to an individual is typically limited. In cases where there are more prospective hunters than the quota for that species, tags are usually assigned by lottery. Tags may be further restricted to a specific area, or wildlife management unit. Hunting migratory waterfowl requires a duck stamp from the Fish and Wildlife Service in addition to the appropriate state hunting license. Harvest of animals other than big game is typically restricted by a bag limit and a possession limit. A bag limit is the maximum number of a specific animal species that an individual can harvest in a single day. A possession limit is the maximum number of a specific animal species that can be in an individual's possession at any time. Shooting, gun usage in hunting is typically regulated by game category, area within the state, and time period. Regulations for big game hunting often specify a minimum caliber or muzzle energy for firearms. The use of rifles is often banned for safety reasons in areas with high population densities or limited topographic relief. Regulations may also limit or ban the use of lead and ammunition because of environmental concerns. Specific seasons for bow hunting or muzzle loading black powder guns are often established to limit competition with hunters using more effective weapons. Hunting in the United States is not associated with any particular class or culture. A 2006 poll showed 78% of Americans supported legal hunting, although relatively few Americans actually hunt. At the beginning of the 21st century, just 6% of Americans hunted. Southerners in states along the eastern seaboard hunted at a rate of 5%, slightly below the national average and while hunting was more common in other parts of the South at 9%, these rates did not surpass those of the Plains states, where 12% of Midwesterners hunted. 
hunting in other areas of the country fell below the national average. Overall, in the 1996 a Euro 2006 period, the number of hunters over the age of 16 declined by 10 percent, a drop attributable to a number of factors including habitat loss and changes in recreation habits. Regulation Regulation of hunting within the United States dates from the 19th century. Some modern hunters see themselves as conservationists and sportsmen in the mode of Theodore Roosevelt and the Boone and Crockett Club. Local hunting clubs and national organizations provide hunter education and help protect the future of the sport by buying land for future hunting use. Some groups represent a specific hunting interest, such as Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, or the Delta Waterfowl Foundation. Many hunting groups also participate in lobbying the federal government and state government. Each year, nearly $200 a million in hunters' federal excise taxes are distributed to state agencies to support wildlife management programs, the purchase of lands open to hunters, and hunter education and safety classes. Since 1934, the sale of federal duck stamps, a required purchase for migratory waterfowl hunters over 16 years old, has raised over $700 a million to help purchase more than 5,200,000 acres of habitat for the National Wildlife Refuge System lands that support waterfowl and many other wildlife species and are often open to hunting. States also collect monies from hunting licenses to assist with management of game animals, as designated by law. A key task of federal and state park rangers and game wardens is to enforce laws and regulations related to hunting including species protection, hunting seasons, and hunting bans. Varmint hunting Varmint hunting is an American phrase for the selective killing of non-game animals seen as pests. While not always an efficient form of pest control, varmint hunting achieves selective control of pests while providing recreation and is much less regulated. Varmint species are often responsible for detrimental effects on crops, livestock, landscaping, infrastructure, and pets. Some animals, such as wild rabbits or squirrels, may be utilized for fernal meat, but often no use is made of the carcass. Which species of varmints depends on the circumstance and area. Common varmints may include various rodents, coyotes, crows, foxes, feral cats, and feral hogs. Some animals once considered varmints are now protected, such as wolves. In the U.S. state of Louisiana, a non-native rodent known as a nutria has become so destructive to the local ecosystem that the state has initiated a bounty program to help control the population. Fair Chase The principles of the fair chase have been a part of the American hunting tradition for over 100 years. The role of the hunter conservationist, popularized by Theodore Roosevelt, and perpetuated by Roosevelt's formation of the Boone and Crockett Club, has been central to the development of the modern fair chase tradition. Beyond Fair Chase, The Ethic and Tradition of Hunting, a book by Jim Posowitz, describes fair chase. Fundamental to ethical hunting is the idea of fair chase. This concept addresses the balance between the hunter and the hunted. It is a balance that allows hunters to occasionally succeed while animals generally avoid being taken. When Internet hunting was introduced in 2005, allowing people to hunt over the Internet using remotely controlled guns, the practice was widely criticized by hunters as violating the principles of fair chase. As a representative of the National Rifle Association explained, T. ENRA has always maintained that fair chase, being in the field with your firearm or bow, is an important element of hunting tradition. Sitting at your desk in front of your computer, clicking at a mouse, has nothing to do with hunting. One hunting club declares that a fair chase shall not involve the taking of animals under the following conditions, helpless in a trap, deep snow or water, or on ice. From any power vehicle or power boat. By jack lighting, or shining at night. By the use of any tranquilizers or poisons. While inside escape-proof fenced enclosures. By the use of any power vehicle or power boat for herding or driving animals including use of aircraft to land alongside or to communicate with or direct a hunter on the ground. By the use of electronic devices for attracting, locating or pursuing game or guiding the hunter to such game, or by the use of a bow or arrow to which any electronic device is attached. 
ranches, Indian black buck, Nile guy, axis deer, fallow deer and Barasinga can now be found on hunting ranches in Texas, where they were introduced for sport hunting. Hunters can pay upwards of $4,000 as fees for hunting a Barasinga. Russia The Russian imperial hunts evolved from hunting traditions of early Russian rulers or Euro Grand Princes and Tsar Euro under the influence of hunting customs of European royal courts. The imperial hunts were organized mainly in Peterov, Tsarskoye Selo, and Gatchina. Australia Hunting in Australia has evolved around the hunting and eradication of various animals considered to be pests. Native animals are hunted rarely in comparison to introduced animals such as camels and deer. There is some controversy regarding the rights of aboriginals being allowed to hunt endangered species for food or ceremonial purposes. Japan, the numbers of licensed hunters in Japan, including those using snares and guns, is generally decreasing, while their average age is increasing. As of 2010, there were approximately 190,000 registered hunters, approximately 65% of whom were 60 years old or older. Wildlife management, hunting is claimed to give resource managers an important tool in managing populations that might exceed the carrying capacity of their habitat and threaten the well-being of other species, or, in some instances, damage human health or safety. However, in most circumstances carrying capacity is determined by a combination habitat and food availability, and hunting for population control has no effect on the annual population of species. In some cases, it can increase the population of predators such as coyotes by removing territorial bounds that would other be established, resulting in excess neighboring migrations into an area, thus artificially increasing the population. Hunting advocates assert that reduces intraspecific competition for food and shelter, reducing mortality among the remaining animals. Some environmentalists assert that introducing predators would achieve the same end with greater efficiency and less negative effect, such as introducing significant amounts of free lead into the environment and food chain. Management agencies sometimes rely on hunting to control specific animal populations, as has been the case with deer in North America. These hunts may sometimes be carried out by professional shooters, although others may include amateur hunters. Many U.S. city and local governments hire professional and amateur hunters each year to reduce populations of animals such as deer that are becoming hazardous in a restricted area, such as neighborhood parks and metropolitan open spaces. A large part of managing populations involves managing the number and, sometimes, the size or age of animals harvested so as to ensure the sustainability of the population. Tools that are frequently used to control harvest are bag limits and season closures, although gear restrictions such as archery-only seasons are becoming increasingly popular in an effort to reduce huntless success rates. Bag limits Bag limits are provisions under the law that control how many animals of a given species or group of species can be killed although there are often species for which bag limits do not apply. There are also jurisdictions where bag limits are not applied at all or are not applied under certain circumstances. The phrase bag limits comes from the custom among hunters of small game to carry successful kills in a small basket, similar to a fishing creel. Where bag limits are used, there can be daily or seasonal bag limits. For example, Ducks can often be harvested at a rate of six per hunter per day. Big game, like moose, most often have a seasonal bag limit of one animal per hunter. Bag limits may also regulate the size, sex, or age of animal that a hunter can kill. In many cases, bag limits are designed to allocate harvest among the hunting population more equitably rather than to protect animal populations. Closed and open season a closed season is a time during which hunting an animal of a given species is contrary to law. Typically, closed seasons are designed to protect a species when they are most vulnerable or to protect them during their breeding season. By extension, the period that is not the closed season is known as the open season. Laws, illegal hunting and harvesting of wild species contrary to local and international conservation and wildlife management laws is called poaching. Game preservation is one of the tactics used to prevent poaching. Violations of hunting laws and regulations involving poaching are normally punishable by law. 
Punishment can include confiscation of equipment, fines and or a prison sentence. In Costa Rica, all forms of sport hunting have been illegal since December 10, 2012. Methods Historical, subsistence, and sport hunting techniques can differ radically, with modern hunting regulations often addressing issues of where, when, and how hunts are conducted. Techniques may vary depending on government regulations, a hunter's personal ethics, local custom, hunting equipment, and the animal being hunted. Often a hunter will use a combination of more than one technique. Laws may forbid sport hunters from using some methods used primarily in poaching and wildlife management. Baiting is the use of decoys, lures, scent, or food. But you involve scaring animals into a killing zone or ambush. Beagling is the use of beagles in hunting rabbits, and sometimes in hunting foxes. Beating uses beaters to flush out game and or drive it into position. Blind hunting or stand hunting is waiting for animals from a concealed or elevated position. Calling is the use of animal noises to attract or drive animals. Camouflage is the use of visual or odor concealment to blend with the environment. Dogs may be used to course or to help flush, herd, drive track, point at, pursue, or retrieve prey. Driving is the herding of animals in a particular direction, usually toward another hunter in the group. Flushing is the practice of scaring animals from concealed areas. Glassing is the use of optics, such as binoculars, to locate animals more easily. Glue is an indiscriminate passive form to kill birds. Internet hunting is a method of hunting over the internet using weak cams and remotely control guns. Netting involves using nets, including active netting with the use of cannon nets and rocket nets. Persistence hunting is the use of running and tracking to pursue the prey to exhaustion. Scouting includes a variety of tasks and techniques for finding animals to hunt. Saluna theory says that animals move according to the location of the moon in comparison to their bodies and is said to have been used long before this by hunters to know the best times to hunt their desired game. Spotlighting or shining is the use of artificial light to find or blind animals before killing. Stalking or still hunting is the practice of walking quietly in search of animals or in pursuit of an individual animal. Tracking is the practice of reading physical evidence in pursuing animals. Trapping is the use of devices such as snares, pits, and deadfalls to capture or kill an animal. Trophy hunting Trophy hunting is the selective seeking of wild game. It may also include the controversial hunting of captive or semi-captive animals expressly bred and raised under controlled or semi-controlled conditions so as to attain trophy characteristics. This is sometimes known as canned hunts. History, in the 19th century, Southern and Central European sport hunters often pursued game only for a trophy, usually the head or pelt of an animal, which was then displayed as a sign of prowess. The rest of the animal was typically discarded. Some cultures, however, disapprove of such waste. In Nordic countries, hunting for trophies was a euro, and still is a euro frowned upon. Hunting in North America in the 19th century was done primarily as a way to supplement food supplies, although it is now undertaken mainly for sport. The safari method of hunting was a development of sport hunting that saw elaborate travel in Africa, India and other places in pursuit of trophies. In modern times, trophy hunting persists and is a significant industry in some areas. Conservation tool, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Hunting provides an economic incentive for ranchers to continue to breed those species, and that hunting reduces the threat of the species' extinction. Controversy Trophy hunting is most often criticized when it involves rare or endangered animals. Opponents may also see trophy hunting as an issue of morality or animal cruelty, criticizing the killing of living creatures for recreation. Victorian-era dramatist W. S. Gilbert remarked, Deer stalking would be a very fine sport if only the deer had guns. There is also debate about the extent to which trophy hunting benefits the local economy. Hunters argue that fees paid contribute to the local economy and provide value to animals that would otherwise be seen as competition for grazing, livestock, and crops. This analysis is disputed by opponents of trophy hunting. 
Some argue that the animals are worth more to the community for ecotourism than hunting. Economics A variety of industries benefit from hunting and support hunting on economic grounds. In Tanzania, it is estimated that a safari hunter spends 50 to 100 times that of the average ecotourist. While the average photo tourist may seek luxury accommodation, the average safari hunter generally stays in tented camps. Safari hunters are also more likely to use remote areas, uninviting to the typical ecotourist. Advocates argue that these hunters allow for anti-poaching activities and revenue for local communities. In the United Kingdom, the game hunting of birds as an industry is said to be extremely important to the rural economy. The Cobham Report of 1997 suggested it to be worth around a £700 a million, and hunting and shooting lobby groups claimed it to be worth over a billion pounds less than ten years later. Hunting also has a significant financial impact in the United States, with many companies specializing in hunting equipment or speciality tourism. Many different technologies have been created to assist hunters, even including iPhone applications. Today's hunters come from a broad range of economic, social, and cultural backgrounds. In 2001, over 13 million hunters averaged 18 days hunting, and spent over $20.5 a billion on their sport. In the U.S., proceeds from hunting licenses contribute to state game management programs, including preservation of wildlife habitat. Conservation Hunters have been driving forces throughout history in the movement to ensure long-term sustainability of natural resources and wildlife habitats. However, excessive hunting and poachers have also contributed heavily to the endangerment, extirpation and extinction of many animals, such as the quagga, the great auk, Stella's sea cow, the thylacine, the blue buck, the Arabian oryx, the Caspian and Javan tigers, the mark, the Sumatran rhinoceros, the bison, the North American cougar, the Altai Argali sheep, the Asian elephant and many more, primarily for commercial sale or sport. All these animals have been hunted to endangerment or extinction. Legislation Pitmani Euro Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937 In 1937, American hunters successfully lobbied the U.S. Congress to pass the Pitman Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act which placed an 11% tax on all hunting equipment. This self-imposed tax now generates over $700 a million each year and is used exclusively to establish, restore and protect wildlife habitats. The act is named for Nevada Senator Key Pittman and Virginia Congressman Absalom Willis Robertson. Federal Duck Stamp Program, on March 16, 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act, which requires an annual stamp purchase by all hunters over the age of 16. The stamps are created on behalf of the program by the U.S. Postal Service and depict wildlife artwork chosen through an annual contest. He play an important role in habitat conservation because 98% of all funds generated by their sale go directly toward the purchase or lease of wetland habitat for protection in the National Wildlife Refuge System. In addition to waterfowl, it is estimated that one-third of the nation's endangered species seek food and shelter in areas protected using duck stamp funds. Since 1934, the sale of federal duck stamps has generated $670 a million and helped to purchase or lease 5,200,000 acres of habitat. The stamps serve as a license to hunt migratory birds, an entrance pass for all national wildlife refuge areas, and are also considered collector's items often purchased for aesthetic reasons outside of the hunting and birding communities. Although non-hunters buy a significant number of duck stamps, 87% of their sales are contributed by hunters, which is logical as hunters are required to purchase them. Distribution of funds is managed by the Migratory Bird Conservation Commission. Species, Arabian oryx, the Arabian oryx, a species of large antelope, once inhabited much of the desert areas of the Middle East. However, the species' striking appearance made it a popular quarry for sport hunters, especially foreign executives of oil companies working in the region. The use of automobiles and high-powered rifles destroyed their only advantage, speed, and they became extinct in the wild exclusively due to sport hunting in 1972. 
the scimitar horned oryx followed suit, while the oryx became critically endangered. However, the Arabian oryx has now made a comeback and been upgraded from a Euro OE extinct in the Wilder Euro to a Euro OE vulnerable a Euro due to conservation efforts like captive breeding. Mark, the mark is an endangered species of wild goat which inhabits the mountains of Central Asia and Pakistan. The colonization of these regions by Britain gave British sport hunters access to the species, and they were hunted heavily, almost to the point of extinction. Only their willingness to breed in captivity and the inhospitability of their mountainous habitat prevented this. Despite these factors, the mark is still endangered. American bison The American bison is a large bovid which inhabited much of western North America prior to the 1800s, living on the prairies in large herds. However, the vast herds of bison attracted market hunters, who killed dozens of bison for their hides only, leaving the rest to rot. Thousands of these hunters quickly eliminated the bison herds, bringing the population from several million in the early 1800s to a few hundred by the 1880s. Conservation efforts have allowed the population to increase, but the bison remains near threatened. White Rhinos, the Journal of International Wildlife Law and Policy cites that the legalization of white rhinoceros hunting in South Africa motivated private landowners to reintroduce the species onto their lands. As a result, the country saw an increase in white rhinos from fewer than 100 individuals to more than 11,000, even while a limited number were killed as trophies. However, the illegal hunting of rhinoceros for their horns is highly damaging to the population and is currently growing globally, with 1,004 being killed in South Africa alone according to the most recent estimate. Other species, according to Richard Conniff, Namibia is home to 1,750 of the roughly 5,000 black rhinos surviving in the wild because it allows trophy hunting of various species. Namibia's mountain zebra population has increased to 27,000 from 1,000 in 1982. Elephants, which had gone down elsewhere for their ivory, have gone to 20,000 from 15,000 in 1995. Lions, which were on the brink of extinction from Senegal to Kenya, are increasing in Namibia. In contrast, Botswana has recently been forced to ban trophy hunting following a precipitous wildlife decline. The numbers of antelope plummeted across Botswana, with a resultant decline in predator numbers, while elephant numbers remained stable and hippopotamus numbers rose. According to the government of Botswana, trophy hunting is at least partly to blame for this, but many other factors, such as poaching, Drought and habitat loss are also to blame. Uganda recently did the same, arguing that the share of benefits of sport hunting were lopsided and unlikely to deter poaching or improve, Uganda's, capacity to manage the wildlife reserves. Studies, a scientific study in the journal, Biological Conservation, states that trophy hunting is of major importance to conservation in Africa by creating economic incentives for conservation over vast areas including areas which may be unsuitable for alternative wildlife-based land uses such as photographic ecotourism. However, another study states that less than 3% of a trophy hunter's expenditures reach the local level, meaning that the economic incentive and benefit is minimal, particularly when we consider the vast areas of land that hunting concessions occupy. Financial incentives from trophy hunting effectively more than double the land area that is used for wildlife conservation, relative to what would be conserved relying on national parks alone according to biological conservation, although local communities usually derive no more than 18 cents per hectare from trophy hunting. Trophy hunting has been considered essential for providing economic incentives to conserve large carnivores according to research studies in conservation biology, Journal of Sustainable Tourism, Wildlife Conservation by Sustainable Use, and Animal Conservation. Studies by the Center for Responsible Tourism and the IUCN state that ecotourism is a superior economic incentive, generating twice the revenue per acre and 39 times more permanent employment. See also References Further reading External links, media related to hunting at Wikimedia Commons